Welcome to A Celtic State of Mind. I'm Paul John Dykes and today I am joined by Lawrence Connolly, Laura Bradburn, JP Mason and Anthony Haggerty to look back on a 90 minutes of football that really epitomises everything that's wrong with Celtic Football Club at this moment in time. I'm looking around my um, esteemed colleagues. I'm going to come to yourself first. Tony Haggerty, um, what do you say after that absolutely embarrassing result there against Rangers? Again, 4-1 against Rangers. Last game of the season, they've torn us to pieces. People can say... You know, um, we've made it hard for ourselves by the sending off, but we weren't anywhere, anywhere near at the races today. You made a, you said a word at the top of the programme when we looked at the team. Predictable. See if you're predictable. Your rivals have had the beating of you and have had the beating of you all season, and they did nothing to change it up, which is why Kennedy shouldn't be anywhere near a new regime, first and foremost, right? And then if you thought those players were going to go out and salvage some pride, then you've just been made to think again. I mean, that's embarrassing it doesn't begin to cover that. I mean, just where did you start? But it was that predictability. Rangers have had their number all season, and you looked at that team, and there was nothing to refresh it. You know, bringing in Griffiths, bringing in Dembele, just something to make Rangers think. That was meat and drink to Rangers today. And do you know what? I, I, again, they strolled it. Absolutely strolled it. Because at this moment in time, they are better than Celtic. And they're better by a considerable distance, actually. A That's considerable a distance much more than I think a lot of us thought. Tony, and, you, you saw Brown there, right? He's two yards off the pace, three yards off the pace, full first half. Why yeah. sort of on at half time? You, you can see he's off the pace, but it gets even worse when he's off the pace and you're down to 10. He's, they, they, everybody has to cover more ground. If you yeah. can't cover with 11. Why does Kennedy think he can cover it with 10? Well, and you've got Sorrow, who's a bit quicker. He's maybe not you know, as polished or as experienced as Brown, but at least they can cover the ground. He's not going to be off the pace. and keep, keep, It's a basic sub for Kennedy to make it half-time. Yep, yeah, keep getting told that Ayer and Elian, he's a player. And you know my thoughts on both. And I, I, I put a message into the group chat at half-time, just after the second half, Elian, he's yeah, he's consistent, all right. He consistently fails to turn up in big games. Five million, not for me. Sorry, I can go any time. You can go through the majority of that team and say the same. I mean, gutless is an insult to the word gutless today, to be honest. You know? Big thing for me, we're, we're talking about Brown, and you're absolutely right, Anthony, in what you say. We could go through that team um, player by player and be critical but the big talking point or one of the big talking points and Laura had spoken about playing Sorrow uh, today instead of Brown let's have a look at Scott Brown's performance here and this is a guy who is quite rightly lauded for his contribution uh, to the last uh, decade of dominance in Scottish football four minutes into the game Brown clatters into McGregor Brown then clatters into Aribo uh, eight minutes into the game he takes out Kent the goal goes in and you're asking Asking yourself um, what happened to Scott Brown when Kent ghosts past him. Uh, the next part that he plays is that uh, in 32 minutes again with the goal, Morelos goes past Brown. 36 minutes, Brown takes Kent out. There's a wee thread developing here. 50 minutes, Brown sold again. Um, you're looking at the, the third goal with Ruth. Who follows Ruth? Who follows the run? Well, Brown failed to. And then he's taken off uh, after an hour. So this sentimentality of you've got to play Scott Brown you've got to play him in a Scottish Cup final you've got to play him against Rangers to give him the, the last hurrah, it's a nonsense he shouldn't have been anywhere near that pitch today and that performance today shows why he shouldn't have been anywhere near that pitch for several months, Sorrow came in along with Turnbull and he dropped back out can anyone on the, on today's show explain why? Sentimentality, it's the number one reason it has to be Listen, no, I, I think they don't want to take a risk oh, we don't want to take a risk, what a fist doesn't he work well it's not working on the park. <laughs> you, you know, you can't stick with something that's not working. But as much as Soros about a risk and he's not as polished, he's got the legs. You know, if Brown's the two-yard shot, he's leaving everybody else two-yard shot because everybody's got to cover up for him. It's... 
I'm going to bring yourself in, JP. Um, what I'm going to counter by that, the last time I had a go at Scott Brown, people said you've always um, been digging Scott Brown. I haven't, actually. I mean, I wrote a number of articles on axom.net. I speak about Scott Brown in glowing terms, but all season, he's been way off it for me. There's been a few, um, you know, 30 minutes against AC Milan, he looked pretty good. There's been some uh, moments, but overall, you know, for me, he has been part of our issue in terms of the playing. Um, Sorrow, what he does is he breaks up the play, but he doesn't just do that because what you see now with Brown, because he doesn't have the legs, he then keeps up with play. Soro then gives you another option. Once he's broken down playing, he's done it a number of times. He's very clumsy. That's one thing we need to get out of his game. He's very clumsy. He gives away a lot of fouls, does Soro. And I can see him picking up a lot of bookings when he plays more games. But it, not only does he break up the play, JP, he then stays up with play. He continues with that, that movement. Whereas Scott Brown can break up the play, make a pass, and he stands. And he's often in his own half as the play rages on. But he doesn't have the ability now or the mobility now uh, to keep up with play. Uh, he's getting turned time and time again. Today, you know, Kent, it was just, it was actually embarrassing at stages, you know, how mobile he is compared to Scott Brown these days. And we're putting him out there. And it's, you know, it's indicative of uh, that performance that we've been beaten for one today. I mean, obviously, Scott Brown's taking the opportunity for us to have conversations like this out of our hands because in two games' time, there won't be the why are we still playing Brown because he won't be in the club anymore. He won't be at the club and that'll be Aberdeen's uh, loss or, or, or gain uh, to the situation. Look, I, I, I don't know. I, Scott Brown, it was horrible to see Scott Brown sitting in the stand like that, you know, in, in this sort of sanitised version of a Rangers-Celtic game at the end of a season where the league was over and arguably, you know, January, you know, it was it was done it was done as soon as Kevin Nisbet scored that equaliser at Celtic Park for me, I, I, that was it. So January, end of the season, our worst ever uh, run of results against Rangers or a Rangers team since the 1999-2000 season. We've long been talking about this farm into a Neil transition, never more so has there been a, a more obvious case that that is what is happening here and that and what is needed is uh, an O'Neill like uh, resurrection so, so to speak um, but yeah so, so, so did okay but you know this was a game you've just said he's got a propensity to uh, make rash tackles and get bookings well that wasn't his uh, if, if, if Walsh was flinging the cards about like he did in the first half then there's every chance we would have been down to nine men um, if, if Soro had been playing like that but look they got a break again a, a red card you know we, we pull up hey, McGregor pulls off a great save they go out of the park score a goal and we get to, go down to 10 men how many are how many, as Kev talks about the footballing gods you know the footballing gods have had it in for us this season big time you know missing team in the first game at Parkhead you know team cobbled together the day before uh, McGregor's own goal no shots at goal from Rangers in that game uh, you know the the last game another own goal John Kenny John Joe Kenny it's just you, you know when th- you know when it's not your your league and it's not your day and and, and that's been summed up perfectly today I think and I'll come to Tony for your thoughts on this Tony that people may say you know you're looking at the, the team on the park today and it runs a lot deeper and I, I know it does I know it does because where we are today we're on we're, we're there because that's all we deserve for nothing hiding at Ibrox having won nothing all season because we've been so bad this season why we've we been so bad well it's not because of Scott Brown he's just part of the issue on the park you can trace this back very interestingly uh, there's a wee league table kicking around on social media talking about the world's um, biggest managerial transfer and who's in the top 10 but Brendan Rodgers so we make something like over 10 million euros for him going to Leicester and what do we do with it we bring in Neil Lennon now that is on Peter Lowell and that performance today if you want to really track it back that's on Lowell it's much higher than Scott Brown's poor performance today and for most of the season this is on Lowell and you know the the uh, suggestion that Peter Lowell will still be at this club in some capacity going forward I think Celtic fans should be frightened at that because he is the reason that we have fallen so despairingly short this season We've been road mapping this people saying that Axon has been very negative Axon's been road mapping this malaise that's been allowed to fester at this club for many a month now. It's not been negative, it's pointing out the fact that 
guys like ourselves and people who turn uh, their money for season ticket supporters, you know, entitled to their opinion and their say, and they're pointing out where the club was going wrong. And I keep getting back to it. If the likes of you and I can see that, and Laura and Lawrence and JP, how can the people at the top not see that? How can they not see, and I've used the analogy before, that we were going downhill on our bogey with knee brakes and square wheels, and there's only one there's only one casualty there. It's, it's a crash landing, and we have crash landed with a bump, and it's gone that you go to Igoops and get turned over 4-1. But it's gone at the fact that Rangers didn't have to play spectacularly well to do that. I can't, like they've cantered the league and like they've strolled it the whole season, and you have not laid a glove on them the whole campaign. You know, I, 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 you should be ashamed if you're at the top at Celtic. To be perfectly honest, you should be ashamed to be a board member right now because. Mm, Support ordinary supporters in this pod in particular was pointing out where you were going wrong, things that had gone wrong, and you did absolutely nothing to address it. Nothing. And it's can I just can I here. just jump in there? I, I sat watching that, and the thing that came to my head was there is one thing that has caused an issue for this Celtic team over the last decade. Any time any decision is made that is driven by sentimentality, that is where we're falling down. Mm-hmm. Neil Lennon got the job the first time because of sentimentality, not because he earned the job. He got the job the second time because of an element of sentimentality and laziness on part of the board, not because he deserved the job. Scott Brown is in the team because of sentimentality. John Kennedy remains at the club in whatever way they can find to fit him in because of sentimentality, because somebody at the club feels like they still owe him a job because he had the unfortunate incident that ended his career. Now, I know that was a tragedy. That was absolutely shocking what happened to him. But how long does he need to be owed a place at the club to make up for that? Um, If Peter Lawwell stays, that's sentimentality on some level as well. You, You... if you're d- making your decisions based on anything other than somebody's ability to do the job, then you're doing it wrong. I think you're 100% right, Laura. Well said. It's not just sentimentality, though. There is no forward planning. We keep talking about it. We're always reactionary. We're no visionary enough to move this club forward in the way that you and I see it moving forward. Always but- reacting. And again, as GP said there, we're going to have to have a Martin O'Neill-like resurrection you know, and it, see when you touch on the, the forward planning, we, we all talked about this after the last game at Ibrox. Correct. John Joe Kenny shouldn't be playing again. Scott Brown shouldn't be getting again. Listen, Eddie turned up again, but he shouldn't have been playing today. You don't get enough. Moy's not a team player, he's an individual, shouldn't be playing. And that great shot he hit, he sent it for 30 yards out, and he had a boy who could have slipped in at the left, and then he didn't do it. He's yeah. too much of a, a Moy, I'm a me player. So we could tell we're setting up with the wrong team. There's players on the team that shouldn't be there. How can, how can the interim manager? No, say something as basic as this. It's not even, you don't even need to say it long term. Brown's legs are gone. He, he can't cover it against the, the Rangers team. John Joe Kennedy's no up. John Joe Kennedy's no up to it. Don't play him. Eddie's no. His heart's no in it. And more, you, you, you're going, there's four players out of 11 that shouldn't have been starting. Well, I'm going to get onto that, Lawrence, because the, the actual scale of this rebuild is frightening. We're, we're sitting 23 points behind Rangers. The goal difference, Rangers 72, Celtic 45. The gulf is absolutely huge. Now, Podge McLeod comes in to say this season has been a nightmare. A nightmare on Kerrydale Street, 100%. Now, what you said, Laura, regarding the sentimentality, let's go back. Let's, go, let's track back to that first appointment. I'll tell you why Neil Lennon got the job. Because his salary was 300 grand a year. That was the first time he got the job. Now, within about 18 months, we were up against a Rangers side that were on the downward spiral uh, financially, and they were paying Ali McCoy's 900 grand a year. Now, that continued when we were winning leagues in the first couple of seasons under Neil Lennon. That continued. We won three league titles. So his, uh, you know, his salary may have gone up slightly, but a team in the bottom tier of Scottish football was still paying their manager 900 grand a year. Celtic, uh, under Peter Lawwell, did not have the ambition at that stage to push on. Never mind second time around. And then you look at when he got the job on the second occasion. What had he done since leaving Celtic? Right? What had he done to merit 
that position second time round. I mean, anybody, can anybody tell me what he did? He went to he Bolton. Had, he, had two, he had two, um, uh, Bolton was a bit of an anomaly because of the financial difficulties there, but from my understanding of the two jobs, he kind of ended things on similar terms and that he was, he ended his reigns kind of pointing the finger at everybody else and, and, and you know, with rumoured fallouts in the dressing room and things like that. But, it, you know, like, sentimentality is the, is the, the right and the privilege of fans. We're allowed to be as romantic and sentimental as we can. That's why you get situations where people say, get James McCarthy and get, you know, he's probably not a Celtic class player, but you're allowed to, you know, dream about whatever you want to dream about. We trust the board or we should trust the board, the staff members and the people within the club to act professionally. And that means looking at the job and saying... If you're not doing the job, you're out. I'm very good friends with people I work with in work. It, it, even my manager, people above me. If I wasn't doing my job correctly, I wouldn't expect them to just keep me on because I'm, I'm a good mate or I'm a good pal. That's that's not how the world works. It's not how a football club should work either. But so, well, somebody comes down to, you know, you touch and trust, is control. Peter Lowell thinks I can keep these guys in because I can control them. That's why why we lost Brendan because he knew he couldn't control them. You know, he loses managers that he can't control. He's not happy. He brings in people that aren't the right quality because he can control them. But he thinks he can control controls everything that goes on at a football club. And this is where it leads to. You know, micromanagement leads to dysfunctionality, and, and you're seeing it throughout the club just now. You know, and if he stays on, you know, hopefully. Uh, it's just kind of an advisory capacity with no power because he's going to be able to take his hands off everything. Yeah, Neil Lennon was brought in the second time to steer the club to the treble treble and that's what he did and they should have parted ways then and Celtic should have brought in a, a manager of Brendan Rodgers' calibre because he had that compensation to do that. That's what should have happened but it clearly didn't. You know, And again, if you'd have been visionary you would, you would have noticed that you know, we were brought in to fill, fill in that void when Brendan left in the February to steer the club over the line. And he did that, and he did that well. And then they should have shook hands and said, thanks, Neil, brilliant, legend. You know, but they just felt that, yep, fine, this is the guy that can, can steer us again. You know, without even thinking. And, and then Lowell made that glib comment, they had a million CVs in the drawer but never looked at them. Uh, absolutely frightening. Why would you not look at CVs of people that have applied for the Celtic job? Because I tell you what, there have been a lot of top candidates in that draw. And I'd love to know who they were at that particular juncture. Because the Celtic job was there because Brendan Rodgers took it there. Mm-hmm. But see if you don't look at them. That goes out in football and players. What does it say about Celtic to players and, and coaches and anyone else that thinks about moving to Celtic or you want to try and attract? You're right. no, I'm yeah. They're unprofessional. Why, why would I go to an unprofessional club? What do I keep saying? Act like a big club. They had a massive chance to act like a big club then and spurned it. Didn't do it in, and have not acted like a big club since. And that's how you think themselves. I think, I think they just, gambled. They gambled, right? And I honestly think, and I'll, 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 I would argue this with anybody, I think their gamble would have just paid off without COVID-19. I really do. I'm not saying Rangers have run the league because of COVID-19. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying the gamble that they took to appoint Neil Lennon as manager, if you look at what he did last season in terms of winning the Europa League group, in terms of the football we were playing, the players did not just you know, immediately switch off to Neil Lennon when he was made permanent manager. They played for him. And yeah, I know that Rangers were getting closer to us by beating us at Celtic Park before Christmas. But then we came back and we were, we were on fire. I was at all those games. Those are the last games that I've been at as a Celtic fan. Well, and since then, it's been sitting at home watching it on these horrendous uh, streams or whatever, past the paradise, whatever it is. It's 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 so destroying. It's like it's like punishment, you know. It's like having to watch. It's like being in jail and being given the opportunity to watch a team. See, since that all that, and again, we'll talk about this, uh, you know, time and time again, JP. But the biggest concern for me is 
79 days, as it quite rightly says, above your shoulder there till our first European qualifier of the new campaign. 67 days since Neil Lennon left office. And tomorrow is 14 days since Dominic Mackay entered the building. I'm not going to say took up his post because we know that hasn't happened. And when we spoke about him being in the building for a week and asking when's he going to address the Celtic supporters, people are shooting you down. There are Celtic fans out there who think this is acceptable. Just continue as is. Get hammered 4-1 at Ibrox. Don't have a right back. You know, look all the way through that team. Don't have a captain for next season. We don't even have a manager. Uh, We don't have a centre half. However, you know, don't criticise the club. Don't ask Dominic Mackay to come out and speak to us. How dare you, um, you know, be so disrespectful than to ask the club to actually come out and explain a few things. This has been disgraceful. And the way the Celtic fans have been treated and the lack of engagement has also been disgraceful. And after a 4-1 defeat at Ibrox, I think it's only fair that next week at some point, we need to hear something from the club. Now, Tony Haggerty... People might be sick of hearing me saying this, but this is getting to the ridiculous point. In fact, it's been ridiculous for some time. 67 days without a manager. You know, 14 days with Dominic Mackay coming into the club. And I could sit here and, and you know, wax lyrical about A, B and C in the, in the grim hope that next season Axel will get more access here and there. But I'm not selling myself down a swanee like that. You've got to be honest about this. It's a disgrace the way they've been treating the fans. We've been pointing it out all season and and before that, in fact, but I think they they have to come out this week and tell us who the manager is to give any kind of hope moving forward. You know, know, they've had their, as you say, what, 67 days? Whatever it is since Neil Lennon left the office. So that's plenty of time. If Celtic are in a position to tell people who their new manager will be they should be doing it on Tuesday I'd rather they did it tomorrow but they can't seemingly because the stock exchange isn't open tomorrow so it has to be Tuesday to give the supporters any kind of hope uh, moving forward you know, it's just, I, I mean they have they have, get back to it, they've cheated them like a customer base mm. and they think this blind loyalty when the season ticket renewals will drop in and people will just go automatically hit the you know, the button to take it up and send a direct debit. You know, if, if, if their manager's no name this week, a lot of people seriously can reconsider buying their season tickets because they've been asked to fork out too much. And one thing they've not got this year is any added value or even value for money. And a 4 1 scudding like that at iBooks, where they just weakly rolled over, it's just might be the last off a lot of people. Listen, guarantee that- of getting back into the games. You know, we don't know when that's going to happen. Like, I, I, if people are like, oh, you're spoiled and, you know, blah, 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 and what other clubs are asking for added value, even if Celtic had won the quintuple treble, right? Which, let's not forget, that was what was on the cards if we'd have been playing to potential. Um, even if we'd still have won that, I would still be looking for some sort of answer from the club about added value because they said that we would get that paid £600 a season ticket holder we don't know when we're going to get back in the ground it doesn't matter about trophies or anything like that it's about getting what you're paying for as a, as a season ticket holder well, Tony said they treated us like a customer base I would say they ha- the problem is they haven't treated us like a customer base well not as a support Company, you know, you know prof- pro- professional companies engage with their customers they give their cu- customers something for value they want to retain them long term Celtic so company demonstrated any of that so they I, you know, I that, I, I, but I'm, I'm saying that Celtic fans aren't customers; they're supporters. Long, oh, no, no, totally. But you know, that's what I mean. e- e- even if Celtic were to treat us like customers, we'd be better off. Yeah. They're just treating us like nothing now. You know what I mean? The, 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 so you maybe get kind of nothing here, customer base, and then supporters. We're definitely down at the bottom. <laughs> the way we're being treated, you know what I mean? They're not even hitting the customer base level. Well. You see the um, the situation that we're currently in, Laura. Um, there's a lot of people saying clear out required. Well, there's going to be a clear out. That much is absolutely you know true because the loan players are all going to go back to their parent clubs. The four of them. You've then got players out of contract. You've then got what I've been calling the big three and Christy I or Neddy, you know, players that have got a value that they may well be interested in. Christy will certainly be talking to clubs ASAP because of his contract situation. We spoke about it a few months ago. There could be upwards of 15 players leaving the building. 
Now that level of uh, rebuild is incredible. I'm not going to use the word unprecedented because it's the most overused word during COVID, but it's incredible. And we probably do have to go back to the rebuild that was required when O'Neill came in. Now, when I'm looking at that side, I'm trying my best here. What's the nucleus of that team that we actually retain? Because even the, the guys that were always given, like McGregor, McGregor's had a poor season. Uh, and I'm, I'm not just basing it on today's game. He's had a, he's a very poor season, Callum McGregor. He's one of the guys that you could stick your your uh, you know your colours to every single week. But he's been poor. Turnbull's come in and, again, I think probably has suffered because he's he's been dragged down at a couple of levels from his, uh, you know, his introduction. Then you're struggling. You Forrest really are struggling. What, what have you got? Forrest Beyond and Taylor. That? I think that's better, isn't it? Um, listen, I... I'm trying to be very measured because what I saw today was just beyond the pale for me. But JP said an interesting thing there. He said, and, and correct me, JP, if I'm misquoting you here, but he said we would have probably scraped the 10 if it hadn't been for COVID-19. Why I, think we we been, I think we would have been far closer. I don't think you would have been seeing dead rubbers. I think, I think Neil Lennon would still be in charge. And I think... You know, I, I I just don't see it being in this in this scenario, and I don't see with fans in the stadium from the start of the season to now. I think it would there would have been ups and downs. Yes, there, I I just don't think it would be twenty three points. I don't think we'd be looking at this goal difference. You look at all the factors that COVID has caused. Celtic Celtic have not dealt with it properly, and they've not handled it right, and that's that's on them as well because they've not been able to to uh, to deal with the situation. But I I, I don't. I don't think for a second we'd be sitting here having watched a dead rubber game. That would have been that, that game would have meant something today, rather. Yeah, than... but the reason I raised it was we've had nine years of absolute domination. We should have been so much further ahead going into oh, yeah. this season than we were. I agree. I agree. I agree. And, <laughs> and the reason I say that as well is because, as far as my research goes, obviously I'm too young to remember, but Jock Steen always says that one of his biggest regrets about the Lisbon Lions is that he didn't break them up sooner. After their success, a lot of them stayed on because of sentimentality. A lot of them stayed on because of what they had given to the club. That is exactly what we've done here. We wouldn't have to be looking at a situation where we're having to ship 15 players out of the club if we hadn't had a plan like we've all talked about. Got rid of players earlier and not kept them on because Scott Brown's got to be the one that captains us to the 10 or... Ayers won all these trophies so we need to make sure he stays for the 10 or Callum McGregor's uh, one of our own so he needs to stay for the 10. It has crippled the decision making at the club. It has absolutely blinded everybody and coloured their thinking to the point where there's some players who could have gone two, three seasons ago who are Mm. still there. Mm. There's some who could have gone last summer who have stayed just to get the 10. That isn't how we should operate. Laura, big clubs constantly evolve. Man U under Ferguson were constantly evolving. They shipped out big names, big players. You know, if they just didn't fit in, if the manager decided they just don't fit in. That's how big clubs operate. You're ruthless, and you're ruthless even more in times of success. And you should be, because you want to keep that success and the run going for as long as you can. Sure, you, you look at your squad and go, right, there's 11 positions in the park. How many for, do we need for each position? You know, yeah. why does it get, you know, you've got three number 10s. Do we need three number 10s? Yeah, you, you know, we've got how many right backs signed? One out on loan and Tony Ralston. I've got a corner out, so we've got two signed. It's, oh, sorry, we had the American boy that we signed, but without a work permit. Yeah, you, you know, it, it, it's things like that. Yeah. Uh, where's your structural planning here? Right. Small Who's our first choice? Right back. Who's our second choice? It, it's not overly complicated, really, is it? <laughs> you know. I said about COVID, though, we would be looking at a completely different Celtic squad right now had COVID nineteen not entered the world in March last year. The summer, the summer last year would not be the same summer that happened without COVID nineteen because I think, I think a lot of people. But all that JP, but Celtic are the only big club that were reacting to COVID. Yeah, that's what I was just going to say. Other big clubs have coped. Why is Celtic? Listen, there's structural problems at the club. In the way that powers used as well. Let's not forget as well, though, that you know you did 
Um, even though it might have been a different summer, JP, you did have a squad there that was strengthened, not only by the new players coming in, but, but with the retention of all the, the best players. And although, yes, I agree with you, because like yourself, I've seen uh, a resurgent Celtic in the second half of last season. Neil Lennon was out his depth this season from early, early doors. And one of the biggest reasons for that, and you can you can go back and everybody's got their different points of view on this, was when he tried unsuccessfully to throw some players under the bus after Ferenc Varos and they just downed tools. Mm-hmm. And that was the moment. Now, I, I mean, when you're looking at the, the new Lennon first time round compared to this, why did he have success? Well, there's a whole myriad of reasons. One of them is we didn't have a, a Rangers in the league. That was one of the big, the big reasons that, that Neil Lennon was a success first time round. And there's no level of revisionism that's going to change that because that's just factually correct, you know. He didn't have a strong Rangers team up against him. The, the one season that he did, Rangers won the league. That was in Neil Lennon's first full season in charge. You then look at the situation that football is changing so, so rapidly. And we're at a situation now where footballers and the modern footballers, and I'm bringing Edward and all these different players in into view here, they're not decision makers, I don't feel that they're decision makers. So what you need is you need a coach that shows them exactly what the game plan is for every game, well in advance. You don't just go out and tell them to work it out for themselves because modern footballers don't do that. Modern footballers need to have a game plan. Neil Lennon admitted as much that he didn't give them it. You've then got McGregor twice this season coming off the park after poor results saying that we didn't know what the game plan was. That's because Neil Lennon didn't give them one. In this modern day, in modern football, in 2021, as a manager of Celtic Football Club and you don't know how to set up a team and you expect your players just to go out and sort it out for themselves, well, we, don't, we do not, as a game, breed decision makers now. That, that's gone. And that might have been the case back in the day when Neil Lennon had Charlie Mulgrew and Anthony Stokes and Chris Commons and they would work things out for themselves and invariably they did. But that was then and this is now. And, and by the way, yeah, it's, it's Lenny's fault, but it's not all Lenny's fault. Because there came a point where the people above him should have realised he's way out of his depth here, way out of his depth. And he had to go far, far sooner than he did. I mean, he went in February. He went on the 24th of February. You know, by which time the, the rot had well and truly set in. And it's, it's now a problem with the rot. It's like proper rot. We need to get rid of all the players before we can rebuild this. It's not as though it's somebody's going to come in like Eddie Howe with a magic wand, bring in half a dozen players, and we're going to have a good team next season. It's much larger than that. And that, that's down to those in charge. That's down to Peter Lowell and co. You've got to look at recruitment. You know, Sorry. you bring in a Yeti instead of Ivan Tonov. You, we don't get a first, first three choices. We didn't get Foster. We didn't get Omar Coley. We didn't, didn't get Con- Tonov. We were short in width when he was looking for two. Two white players we didn't get any delivered, and you, you've got to wonder what's going on. That if we can see that we need white players for cover, we don't bring any in. We lose James Forrest, and we lose Mikey Johnson, and every team knows we're going to have to play through in the middle because we don't have any width. Consequently, any fullback looks worse for us because you know what? There's no width in front of him. We're asking him to do more. Quite because- a quick Lawrence. These are the types of comments that, that you've got to challenge. Adam Beanie Smith. It's the same every time from Paul. I guess you're talking about me. Um, He doesn't speak for the hardcore element of the support. And I'm going to pull it up because at no point in my 42 years have I ever claimed to speak for anyone other than Paul John Dykes. And by the way, am I not part of that hardcore support? What does that mean, hardcore element of the support? What does that actually mean? Somebody needs to explain. I'm I'm quite a, I like to think I'm an intelligent guy, but maybe not. You know, well, it, Tony, I'm, I'm sitting here thinking reality. the exact same thing. I'm yeah. like, what? What does hardcore mean? Yeah, you know, maybe it, maybe it's somebody that just sits online, right? I've thrown out, you know, behind an anonymous avatar. You know, the Correct. same thing that players on the Celtic class. What does that mean? What is that? Someone, you know, is it you know, just bandy these terms about? You know, hardcore element. Ah, seriously, I. I I need that explained to me because I... So, I'm, that so I'm, I'm going to accept that I don't speak for the vast majority of the hardcore Celtic support. And that's why we've gone live and interactive for every single game this season, right? Not only to give a whole team of contributors their platform to air their views, but also to give literally hundreds. We had 170 comments came in before the game kicked off, before we went live this morning. So this platform 
ensures that it isn't my narrative. And even if you want to agree or disagree, that's what it's all about. But this this view that he doesn't speak for me or he doesn't speak for us, I don't claim to. I never will. I'm here giving my view, agree or disagree, but get involved and give us something a wee bit more tangible than that, I would guess. Because I think most of the comments that come in um, are balanced, even if they disagree with you. They're not going to agree with the five of us. I wouldn't, so, expect anyone to, I wouldn't expect anyone to agree with all of us. I, mean, I, I know that people are going to maybe disagree with me. Somebody said in the comments on Wednesday, JP's my least favourite member of the Axon team. Cool. I'm fine well, with there's that. two, is it? There's two, is then, JP? As long as you're not slagging off my appearance, like you know, those clowns on the, to the Sky Sports thread, I don't care. If you, if you don't like what I say, fine. I, I'm all right with that. But you know, don't, don't go to cave, cave painting level and start slagging people's appearances off, you know, because like, that's just... That's just childlike, that's playground stuff. Exactly. I mean, what we've uh, offered this season is a platform under circumstances which was probably more um, needed now than ever, where fans can come in, Celtic supporters can come in and air their views. We're even doing a dial-in show as of, of Wednesday where fans are going to be appearing on the, on the screen to air their views. Um, and there's no other way that you can get a collection of views than, than make it live and interactive. So it's not about my specific views or my narrative. And I only appear on the show twice a week um, and then on the match days. But what we do give you is an opportunity to come in and question us. Tell us what else Celtic should have done differently because I feel it's a collective responsibility. And when you look at that today, the players are miles off it. The manager's in a position that he's not capable of uh, withholding. Without a a shadow of a doubt, he's nowhere near being Celtic uh, class as a manager. And neither was the guy that he replaced in Neil Lennon. But these decisions have been made by uh, people like Peter Lowell and and others. I I think it's meant to be others, but obviously he's the guy that makes the decisions at that level. So you've got to you've got to hold them responsible for the the level to which Celtic have plummeted to this season. Listen. Well, I was I was just going to jump in and say about the hardcore supporter thing. Now you know that I've spoken at length about I hate this tribalism and this ownership of what it is to be a Celtic supporter. You and I sat on New Year's Day to give Celtic supporters content on this channel. Mm-hmm. JP is a massive collector of the memorabilia and uh, takes great pride in showing that. Tony is as knowledgeable a Celtic fan as I've ever come across. Lawrence is as pan- passionate a Celtic fan as I've come across. I could go on at length about everybody on this team. What this team shows is there is a wide plethora of Celtic supporters both on this panel and watching this show. I wouldn't say any of them are any more or any less of a Celtic supporter than anybody else. I've said it before. If you tell me you're a Celtic supporter, I believe you. That's all I need. I don't need a season ticket. I don't need a retro shirt. I don't need uh, collectibles. I don't need sticker albums, whatever. (laughs) Yeah, but do you know what I mean? You You can do... Being a Celtic supporter is whatever you want it to be. If you want to be a collector, if you want to go to every match home and away, if you want to sit and watch it on your TV because that's how you enjoy watching it, that's it. There's no there's no standard or level you need to meet to be a Celtic supporter in my eyes. See, the big thing as well, Laura, is um, let's look at the, the real root of the, the problem here. Let's not try and pick up on anything that gets said on a Celtic podcast. The, the root of the issue is at the club not on a Celtic state of mind or any other Celtic podcast for that matter. Um, So let's focus on that. That's what I would say to anyone. Let's focus on the root of the issue here. Um, And when it comes to the season ticket debate, Laura, I'm I'm amazed that this season has come to light that apparently there is a view that you can only have an opinion if if you've got a Celtic season ticket. And that's something that's been raised to us, um, you know, and that, that's a view that's shared by many, even some at the club, that uh, you're not entitled to air your view unless you're a season ticket holder. And I, and I think that's quite a dangerous view to take as well. I well, think, listen, uh, if, Ar- sorry, on you, you go, on, on you, go. you didn't need season books to go to games. It was people without season books that saved the club, you know, save ourselves, that, you know, that stepped in, that backed Fergus. You know, if we waited, people that always had season books, it... I, I, I don't get it, you know, it's why are you not allowed an opinion? Because you don't agree with us. <laughs> you, you know, is that what they're saying, you know, pff, or we can't control you, we can't try to take your book off you? It's just, 
It's not something that... It is, and the big thing is we're going to continue uh, on a daily basis to challenge what's happening at the club, uh, challenge that performance today, which was pathetic, um, as was the result. It's been a very disappointing season. Um, so we can't be silent on that. Let's hope that during the week uh, upcoming that we do have some developments and some engagement because the club are going to find it a very hard sale uh, come season ticket renewal time. Regardless, if we don't have someone in place and we don't have a strategy and a plan on how to get this club rebuilt. Now, we're going to call it quits at that. Uh, We're over 30 minutes. It's the post-match. Celtic have been absolutely hammered 4-1 at Ibrox by Rangers. Thank you, everybody, for getting involved in the comments section, be that through Facebook. Twitter or YouTube Um, if you haven't done so already get yourself subscribed on YouTube and um, we will continue to grow and continue to create free content for people to enjoy all that's left for me to say is thank you all for joining us on A Celtic State of Mind 